you are getting the binders personally delivered to your homes tomorrow. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. I was like, I'm missing a big binder. You are not. <laughs> I, mean, I usually get them tonight or whenever, you know. You know, if, if this was a real in-person meeting, we would have doled them out tonight. But yeah. Because it's not, we will be, uh, they're all on Lindsay's desk, ready for action tomorrow. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. They're a little heavy. So those new board members just, you know, lift with caution. Well, I feel like they've gotten bigger just in I my time. Put them on a diet, but, um, you know, there's a lot of information in there. I appreciate it. Wow, it's seven o'clock and I don't see a, quite a bit of our board. Yeah. Huh. I guess, especially our, our um, chair. Sure. We will uh, obviously wait for him to hop in. Let me make sure I'm not getting any text that needs. So if anyone's having trouble. Nope. Well, what I can do is invite everyone again that is still not here. Let's see. Dr. Brahma, which link? We um, there's a few of us on a different link. Do you want us all to come to this link? Yes, I don't know which link you are. Maybe you were on the wrong night. I'm not sure if the links went out for another. We board. went on the link that came in the email from Lindsay. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, let me. This is the one that I had in my calendar. Okay. So I Let's, just, anyone that didn't sign in yet, I have sent them an email. Okay. There's uh, Dr. Fletcher. He was on the other one. Danielle's in the other one. Michael Brand is in the other one. I'll go tell him to get on this one. I'm yeah, here I, now. I had sent them invites too. Yeah, Dr. Fletcher. I don't know what happened to the two different links. Yeah. Um, the one that's in the agenda itself is the one that we were in. That is so interesting. She must have created a new one. Oh boy, I hope. Were there any other members of the public in? Um... There was just one person. And Dr. Another... Brumman, I can leave that one open on my browser. So if anybody comes in throughout the evening, I can send them over here. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Krause. That would be very helpful. I wouldn't want anyone left in limbo. Board of Ed meeting limbo, that would not be good. And I'll find out why there were two different links sent out. Um, so I don't understand how that happened. But it well, looks like, do we have everyone now, Dr. Fletcher? I'm going to take a look at our list here now to see. One, two, three, four, five. All right, six counting me, seven now. So that's a quorum. So... With that, I'm going to call the uh, meeting of the Board of Education to order. Today is Wednesday, February the 2nd, 2022. The time now is 7.04 p.m. As you are able, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag 
of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. You can be seated and I'm going to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Michael Branda. Here. Danielle Drozd. Here. Dr. Bruce Fletcher. Here. Beth Mankey Hutt Wagner. Here. Richard Laverriere. Amy Parati. Here. Sam Sharma. Jessica Weaver. Here. Anastasia Yap. Here. I have everyone here except Mr. Lavieri and Mr. Sharma. Okay. So um, at this time, there are other people that are trying to get in. Apparently, they're trying to connect to the other link. So <clears throat> I'm going to try to help them out as well. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to move on to... Uh, Agenda item B, which is public participation on any matter related to board responsibilities. We limit civil participation to three minutes. We ask that you want to speak, that you would uh, state your name and the street that you live on. And we'll wait a moment for that. Danielle, maybe if you could do me a favor, would you send the link to this one to uh, the mayor? She's looking to get in. I can invite her as well. Okay, if you would do that, please. There we go. And Wendy's monitoring the other room to make sure people come forward if they got into the wrong meeting. Okay. All right. All right. I don't see any hands or any requests for public participation. So we are going to now move on to uh, agenda item C, which is new business. And the first item for tonight is discussion and possible action on the soccer scoreboard. Dr. Blum uh, Brummett, if you want to uh, give an explanation, please. Yes. And there it goes. Uh, about two weeks ago, our director of parks and recreation, I just got to there we go, uh, reached out to me that he had obtained a generous donation from a local business that would allow him to offset the cost of a scoreboard over in field number one um, at the high school. So he wanted to discuss that with me. And, and the big issue really became, oh boy, now people are going to be eating in here. Um, he wanted to see if we had a policy from the Board of Education about naming items. And uh, we do not actually. The reason he wanted to know that is because the person, the donor wanted to have their name on the uh, scoreboard because they were paying a substantial amount of money to uh, offset the cost. So the board was provided with a memo from um, our Parks and Rec Director, Bill DeMeo and he described the cost of the scoreboard, the generous donation to underwrite the cost of the scoreboard, and that he had worked with myself and Chris Myers, our athletic director, regarding the particulars and how it would all come together. And the generous donor is Turgeon Jewelers. So long story short, we, the Board of Education does not have a naming policy. That is something we may want to consider down the road, uh, because if you don't have such a policy, then it could leave the door fairly wide open for a lot of requests to name things after people. Um, so we may want to take that up in a separate um, policy subcommittee meeting. But for now, I think it's a very beneficial, um, a very beneficial opportunity for us to have a scoreboard. The one on the field now does not work. Um, and we're forced to use what's like a portable um, scoreboard that's on wheels. So that is, you know, not really a, a very good way to do things over there. And we do, those fields are used constantly by both 
school uh, for school operations, as well as parks and rec operations, and even some community operations. So long story short, I would recommend that we do approve this and perhaps down the road consider um, looking at developing a naming policy. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Fletcher. Okay, very good. Uh, I think that that's a very good idea that we need to take that up very soon as a policy. So what I will do at this point, I'm gonna ask for someone to make a motion. And then once we get a motion and a second in, then we will open it for discussion. Uh, Ms. Rose, you had your hand up. Oh, okay, no. All right, can someone make the motion? I can do it. Okay. Move the Newington Board of Education permit the installation and naming of the scoreboard to be installed on soccer field number one at Newington High School. Okay, motion's made. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Okay. So I believe, I'm not sure who did that. There were two of them. Danielle Drozd, okay. And Danielle, we're going to open it up for discussion. Your hand is up already, so why don't you go ahead? So I want to preface this um, so that we all know that I am very good friends with Mr. Turjan. Um, so I don't want anyone to think that I'm um, playing favorites in this conversation. So I don't want that to come out later. Um, yeah. I, I just... I think allowing local businesses to support in this way is a fantastic way to offset costs. So um, I grew up in a small town in New Jersey before I moved up here and um, Duke's like, as in like Duke university wanted to build a new high school, but the deal was it would have to be called Duke high and the town said no. And um, well, I'm 49 years old and they still have their old ratty high school <laughs> um, that many years later. So you know, if we have local businesses that are willing to support us in this way, and, and our thanks to them is to say, you know, what we put Turjan Jewelers on the scoreboard, I, I just, I think, I know we have to make a policy, but I think it's a good idea. I think it benefits us. I think it benefits our 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 um, businesses in town. So I do support it. I think it's a great idea. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Laverriere. Yes. Hi. Um, I just I, I think that it's also a great idea. And thank you to uh, Turjan Jewelers for, um, you know, uh, sponsoring this. Uh, I just uh, was hoping that perhaps we could maybe add something above it because the sign doesn't say Newington High School. So maybe if we could put like a, I don't know, like a metal banner or something there as well, just to, you know, to say the high school as well. OK. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Anastasia Yelp. Hello, everyone. Um, I also am in agreement with Danielle. I think it's a great idea for local businesses to be able to donate to offset costs. I just had a question, um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Fletcher, for Dr. Brummett, um, if that's okay. Yes, it is. Go ahead. Um, are there any other businesses that were willing to contribute to this? Because I saw it said it cost like 10500 and they were giving 7000 Were there any other businesses um, that were... Uh, willing to offset the cost, or was it just charge controllers? I uh, Bill DeMeo handled this entire process, but I believe the balance of the scoreboard will be paid for out of his uh, capital budget, and okay. um, so that's where the rest of it. I don't know whether he tried to get numerous uh, donors or whether he just wanted worked with Turgeon and then th knew that he had enough in his um, capital budget to cover the rest. Okay, yeah, but I, I definitely think it's a great idea. So I just wanted to say that. All right, thank you very much. And Ms. Weaver? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, just going along with that, I guess I was wondering in terms of like the actual motion, I was like, are we approving this from a policy standpoint or from a financial standpoint? And I guess who's on, on the hook for what? So uh, just wanted to clarify that. So mm -hmm. we're not financially. No, we're not. Okay, just wondering, because I know with like, the swim scoreboard that was like yeah. a lot needed um no yeah I, I i'm in agreement with with all my colleagues here i think you know having local businesses uh chip in wherever we can you know offset costs is always a good thing i think you know um i think there should be as 
I will say I'm going to be biased as someone on the policy committee. There should be a policy just so we have it in writing. Um, <laughs> but I think in terms of like, you know, putting local businesses around, we see it all the time at CLIM. Um, we see it all, all around our, our town anyway. So, um, you know, I think it, it just will, will only add to, to exactly what we've already been doing in our town um, <laughs> fields versus our school fields. I think, you know, that'll be just another thing that, adds to our town um in terms of drumming up business and i'm i'm looking forward to that and appreciate uh all the input from from our businesses so um yeah i just wanted to clarify that so as long as it's just a, a policy thing and we're good to go i think yep <clears throat> so you are correct in that this is just a policy just a procedure uh is there anyone else from the board that wishes to comment or ask any questions Seeing that there is nothing more, I'm going to uh, ask the clerk to uh, call the roll. Michael Branda. Yes. Danielle Droz. Absolutely. Dr. Bruce Fletcher. Yes. Beth Mankey Hutt Wagner. Yes. Richard Laverriere. Yes. Amy Parati. Yes. Sam Sharma. Yes. Jessica Weaver. Yes. Anastasia Yap. Yes. The motion passed unanimously, 9-0. Okay, very good. All right. So the next uh, item under new business is the presentation of Superintendent of Schools 2022-2023 budget to the Board of Education. And I just want to remind everybody that this is just a presentation tonight. We will not be taking action on anything at this time. Okay, so with that, Dr. Brumman, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. And I, I think when you and I had prepped for the meeting along with Ms. Hub Wagner, we agreed that the questions would be at the end. Yes. So we can get through the presentation smoothly and then jot your questions down. We can answer them as many as you uh, have this evening. I just want to make sure I've gotten a couple of texts and uh, emails that there are still members of the public that can't get in. Wendy, are you still monitoring the other meet? Maybe she's in it. <laughs> Dr. Brum, Dr. Brum, this is uh, Richard. Um, I believe there was three people in the room when I, when I, I came in at 7.09. I think there was two or three people in there at that time. Okay. And um, I don't know if, I know Wendy was going to make sure she monitored that meeting so that any folks that were having difficulty would be given this link. Um, so hopefully that is being taken care of. Uh, I believe okay. Wendy's in the other meeting right now. She left here. Perfect, all right. So, yep, and Deb mentioned that we are good to go with no one in the meeting. We, it looks um, like I'd we have a question. I just have a question because um, I was trying to join from my other, my phone and it says that someone needs to let you in. So I'm not sure if people are able to get let in to that meeting. So maybe that's why there's nobody else in there. Yeah, there's a few people messaging me. They can't get in as well. Goodness. Um, I did put the link in the chat, but that won't help people with, uh, with getting in if they don't see the chat feature. So I am trying to think of a solution to get those people in. I'm, anyone yeah, on my We still have some idea? counselors that, that can't get in. Okay. Well, why don't we press pause so that no one who wants to be yeah. here is, is excluded from this. Um, Let's do that. So I'm going to mute my mic. And why don't I send an invite to all the counselors because we know that they, they may be the ones. And uh, Steve, could you reach out to Wendy to make sure she is um, looking at anybody that might get um, <clears throat> beeped in or doorbelled in? Yes, I'll do that right now. Dr. Brahmet, I'm not positive, but I think only the owner of the Google Meet can let people in. So I don't know who the host is of that original link. If it's somebody outside of Newington Public Schools. Mm. 
We had other people from outside come in. Oh, okay. Then I'm it's not sure what's what's going on. Yes, they. So I'm I'm just jumping in because I have to leave the meet when somebody's in the other one. But people can get into the other one if they're joining by phone. So I've been able to send a few people over to this meet. Okay. Again, we apologize for any confusion that has been caused here. We're not really sure why two meetings were generated, but um, we will do what we can to get it rectified. Yeah, I'm trying to find out who the host of the other one is because they could change the host controls to allow anybody to come in, but I'm not sure if it's Lindsay or if Sophie had set it up. I have seen several counselors come in uh, in the past few minutes. Is anyone aware of others that are still trying to get in? Yeah, there's a couple members of the public. I gave them this link and they weren't able to access it. They were? They were not. Um, I'll ask him again. Would it be beneficial if maybe I put, excuse me, presented a slide in that meet that directed people to come to this meet? I think that is a fantastic idea, Mr. Friese. I knew that my esteemed colleagues would come up with a good solution. So, Steve, the, the only issue is I'm in there now. So the people who are coming in, I can get them over here. The problem is the people who can't get in because they're trying to join from the outside and there's no host to admit uh. them. Okay. I hate to say the F word, but what about just posting it on Facebook too? Or the NPS update thing. The way NPS you update's it out. a great idea. Mr. Brando put in the chat. NPS. Mr. Brando put in the chat that we should do an NPS notify. Oh, All I right. see that. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, with uh, with this team's permission, why don't we take a five minute pause while I do an NPS notify, which will include the correct information. Okay. okay. Yeah. We'll All right. Five. So we'll pause the meeting for about less than five minutes while I do that. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Brummett, before yes. you do that, could you, if I put the link to the other me in the chat here, could you go into it and see if you are the host? Because if they set it up that you're the host, you could change the host controls and let anybody in. So if you jump over to that meet real quick, I'll, I'll, I can tell you. Very good. It looks like people are getting in now.
right, good evening again. Uh, Wendy ha and I have adjusted the settings in the room next door to let make sure that people get in if they want to get in. Uh, I did send out a school messenger yesterday with the proper link. Um, that was that reminder that I sent out. So I think the only obstacle right now would be folks not affiliated with the school district. And they wouldn't get a school messenger anyway because they wouldn't be connected to our... Um, but if people are using the wrong link and they go to the other meeting, Wendy can now let them in and send them over our way. So I think we're, I think we are uh, resolving that issue. My apologies. I can tell you that uh, my secretary is on medical leave and I've got my, someone else helping me out. And perhaps there was a snafu that way, but I think we're, uh, I think we're ready to go with your permission, Dr. Fletcher. I will start the presentation. Please go ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much. And my apologies to anyone that was inconvenienced by the link issue, but hopefully we've gotten everyone in that wants to be in. Okie dokie. All right. So I wanted to start my presentation by uh, just showing the Board of Education that in order for us to move the district forward, we have to have coherence within our district. And what that means is that the goals that we've set, being the board and superintendent, align directly with district goals and theory of action and the district continuous improvement plan. And there is research that shows when the board and the superintendent work co co coherently and collectively regarding school district matters that school district and student achievement increases. I also want to start off our meeting with some positives. We have much to be proud of in Newington. And while we had a you know tight budget year, we are continuing forward. We continue to successfully and safely navigate the pandemic. Uh, it's not easy, but our staff administration and support staff, all, all stakeholders are working very hard on behalf of the children to keep our schools safe and running at top speed. The Anna Reynolds project continues to be moving forward and it's running on time and on budget at this time. Our pre-K program has nearly doubled their enrollment over the last three years, and we have appropriately integrated our classrooms and are no longer under state supervision. Our equity work continues to expand throughout the district in a variety of ways. Our teachers are working tirelessly in their PLCs, professional learning communities, to analyze student data and develop strategies to improve student achievement. All of our schools are increasing their SEL efforts in a variety of ways and our recent efforts to live stream sports, concerts, and plays has been highly successful. We get so much positive feedback about that. Just want to remind the board, these, these goals have been reviewed several times with the board, but these are really all that we have set forth to achieve this year uh, as a result of our collective work together. I think we lost her. We did. She's coming back in. Okay. This is a night to remember. Dr. Fletcher, I just wanted to note to um, we were just saying before everyone joined this meeting, um, board members will be getting their budget books tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Dr. Brummett just said that. So I just want to make sure anyone who wasn't here before. Good. I'll just make sure I get my weightlifting belt out. She's on her way back into the meet. Okay. Having some technical issues on top of it. <clears throat> wow, we're having a great night tonight with, apparently my technology went AWOL. Um, <laughs> so I don't know how much of my presentation you did see, so. Um, I was I, last I knew I was talking about board goals. 
Right. That's where I, that's where I left off. Or yes, we all yes. left off. My apologies. My internet gave way, which never happens. But of course, tonight it, it did happen. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, we were back one slide right there. There we go. Um, we are strengthening our partnerships with family and the community. We're on, getting ready to undertake a com community and school district committee that will create that outreach. And in fact, to what some board members said earlier tonight, we're hoping to even find outside organizations that may want to uh, support us in some financial way. We are developing high functioning professional learning communities. We're doing a lot of work on that this year and we wanna continue preschool expansion planning. I think it's important before we dive into all the numbers this evening um, for the board to really understand our changing demographics. And this is these are pretty significant changes um, this chart starts out quite some time ago, 1978. Um, I was actually a freshman at Newington High School. And um, this is what our demographics looked like then. We, we had a very low special ed population. 504, did I, I don't even know if they were identifying kids for 504 back then. Our EL population was small. We had no free or reduced lunch information. And our open choice numbers were very small. And you can see over time, those changes were somewhat incremental until you fast forward to 2008. Then things started to really jump. And notably from 2008 to 2018, you can see how our special ed numbers went up significantly, our 504 numbers, our EL population, which by the way is now referred to as ML. Our free reduced lunch was at 21% then, open choice numbers, quadrupled over those span of time, doubled and quadrupled, and our magnet school population increased. And lastly, this year, we are looking at some substantial increases as well. The uh, special ed rates have gone extraordinarily high. I do know, having done some research about the per pupil question that I had um, received the other day, that that rate is somewhat tied to our recent increase in open choice students. It appears that of all the open choice students we receive, 30% have special needs. Uh, 504 has jumped. Our EL population, you can see, continues to go up. Our free and reduced lunch um, numbers have gone up 10% in the last four years. And as I mentioned earlier, we have increased our open choice numbers for a variety of reasons, but that has had an interesting impact on our special ed uh, percentages and our magnet school numbers uh, continue to be pretty stable or a little bit above what they were four years ago. We continue to get increased diversity. If you look at our diversity from 2011 to now, you can see that while our Asian population has remained stable, our African-American population has been relatively stable, our Hispanic population has gone up 10%. And as you will note here, we are continuing to get more and more diverse where we used to be 67% of our students were white. Now it's 55%. And I will tell you that at least one of our schools, it's less than 50% are now white. So we are conti continuing to change, which I think is a very good thing. But when you have an increasingly diverse student population, you have increasingly significant needs to address all of those stakeholders. And here's kind of a deeper dive into our ML population at this time. We have um, ongoing increases really at all of our schools. We had last year, our total was 276. Currently we're at 314. If you look at the percentages, we've gone up a percentage since last year. And if you look at the actual student headcount, um, we have grown to 75 new students this year who qualify as um, ML or EL, and that's up from 67 at the same time last year. You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the impact of the pandemic. And actually, before I go any further, sorry, with all our fits and starts, I didn't do this earlier, but I wanna thank my team that is on the line tonight, Lou Jakimowicz, uh, Steve Farisi, Wendy Krause, Kristen Freeman, all of my central office colleagues, as well as all the principals on the line tonight, or those even if they aren't on the line tonight, what they have done to get us through this pandemic is nothing short of heroic. Um, the work that we've done, the efforts they've made with our plans, our uh, 
hybrid learning, our kids who are still on temporary remote from time to time, uh, has all been through their collective efforts. And up until recently, many of our principals and administrators and nurses uh, were spending a lot of time on the weekends and evenings doing contact tracing. That, requ that requirement has since uh, faded away, but up until very recently too, our school nurses had to work on the weekends because we were getting so many re referrals or questions from parents about um, their child testing positive like on a Saturday or a Sunday. So the, the, the re work of our district has been unbelievable. But additionally, we have seen a dramatic impact on our kids this year. We kind of started off the year thinking this is going to be a much easier year than last year. You know, we our last month and a half of school, we had absolutely no new COVID cases. We really started the year off just ready to, quote, go back to normal. And that is not what happened. We're seeing our kids, especially those who may have been full remote for over a year, come in with significant um, social, emotional and behavioral issues. The board may note that I occasionally alert them to ambulances at schools. The vast majority of those calls are social, are emotional reasons. Our kids uh, are suffering from anxiety and depression, largely linked to some of the stressors of the pandemic. Even our staff has really suffered during the pandemic. We have several staff members who are out right now for those challenging reasons. And of course, uh, when staff are not doing well, often that drives up our sub costs because we have to obviously cover classes when a teacher cannot be in school. We are grappling with learning loss. We're working really hard at it, but it is a real issue for us. And again, kids who were full remote are the ones that have suffered the most significant losses, but we are really working hard. And that is one of the primary functions of our PLCs right now is how do we attack these problems and get through the, um, you know, get these kids back on track. We've had a lot of turnover in some of our departments, especially our paras and tutors uh, and subs. Those are areas that, we have a hard time keeping staff on occasion as well as many of our neighbors. Uh, if it weren't for the unbelievable efforts of Kim Davis and Steve Farisi, uh, I have no doubt that we might've been one of those districts that had to take a COVID relief day because we didn't have enough staff, but they have worked tirelessly to make sure we have staff, but it's not, it's something that you have to really do active recruitment and, and constant work to keep your staffing levels appropriate. And obviously there's been a lot of expenses to keep the schools open fully and safe. We did rely on our COVID monies for some of that, but some of that money did not cover all of our expenses. We've done 10 so our kids could eat outdoors until the weather turned cold. We certainly have uh, received some free tests from the federal government, but we've also ordered some COVID tests because it really cuts down on staff and student ab absenteeism. We've had outdoor furniture so kids can do outdoor learning activities or again, eating outdoors all for safety reasons. I think it's important with the staff, students coming off of or still in the middle of a very challenging time that, you know, the decisions the board makes this evening or not this evening, but over the coming evenings reflects that we know that our staff have had to make heroic efforts and there's ongoing significant challenges and stressors. We still have kids on remote, you know, temporary remote. So there are occasions where a teacher has kids in front of her and kids at home and it's not easy. It's very challenging. We certainly want all of our current programs to continue. If we were to lose programs now, uh, our teachers who are already extraordinarily stressed, that would just add one more thing to their plate. Um, and we wanna maintain our current levels of health and wellness support. Frankly, uh, I've had folks approach me about adding a school counselor at the high school because they are flat out day in and day out with chronic challenging students who are really having a hard time staying in school. Uh, I, I did not put that in the budget because we, we are on a very tight budget constraint, but I want folks to know that that could have easily been a, um, a request that could have gone forward. And I do hear someone that wants to get in. So give me one second. Oh, no. All right. So what does our budget our budget's designed to maintain needed critical levels of support, but we also have to adhere to mandates. And we are, I am recommending some minimal enhancements. The ESSER funding allows us to continue with our expanded intervention and security staff through 2023. So some of the grant sunsets in 2023, 
and some of it sunsets in 2024. Our grants guidelines are very specific. They cannot be used to offset operating budget shortfalls. I had to write the grants as did Wendy, and we were guided on how to do it through uh, various categories, but the state was clear that we couldn't use it to backfill operating budget shortfalls. We are going to add two new UConn ECE courses. Kristen Freeman and Dr. Gerald Harrison, our equity coordinator, worked with UConn to bring forward these two courses, If You Love It, Teach It, and Contemporary Issues in Sports. I am certain those are going to be extraordinarily popular. Uh, if You Love It, Teach It is designed to encourage students to go into the teaching profession and the contemporary issues in sports uh, will sort of teach or expose interested students to some of the fields in sports management or other similar fields. Um, we've also developed, we want to develop a reading curriculum at the middle level to go along with some of our recovery efforts. And we are going to continue the summer credit recovery program at NHS that is largely grant funded and also parent fee funded, but we, it will use an existing staff member who will help uh, run the program. What is not in the budget, the board may recall that we have a plans process that we utilize every year where teachers or administrators can bring forward proposals about what they'd like to see happen in the district. Uh, we had a lot of good proposals this year, a lot of very well thought out proposals that I simply did not put into the budget because I really have, we have the collective team here has done everything we can to keep costs down. We uh, had a proposal to expand the world language program at the middle school so that it would go down to grade seven, but that would take an additional four teachers. Uh, we were asked to provide a new science teacher at NHS because our medical science academy is extraordinarily popular and uh, our teacher Jen Fries has gotten advanced training in EMT work and wanted to offer some advanced coursework in that, uh, as well as our science class sizes are through the roof. Uh, so that position would support the science department as a whole, but that is not in the budget. We also were asked to provide a new social studies teacher at the high school because our, so our social studies classes are also quite high and there are some electives that we'd like to uh, offer, but that is not in the budget. There was a proposal to offer uh, to establish a new director of career development, and that would actually have implications for the middle school, but that is not in the budget. Our elementary folks recommended an itinerant music teacher because our band program continues to be really popular. You know, we get tremendously positive feedback from families about our band program, but the um, the teachers would are feeling it's really hard to get all of that done in, in current staffing levels. And finally, there was a request for a new music teacher at the high school to expand elective offerings and orchestra programs, but that again is not in the budget for next year. Dr. Brahmet, I wanted to make sure too, I think I just heard the doorbell. All right, let's see. All right, thank you. All right, cost escalation. Cost escalation over the years. This is just a, an illustrative slide that shows where we're at with our special ed costs, um, some of the grant money we get for special ed, EL program costs, and um, magnet school tuitions. Um, I, notably, we have had somewhat of a decrease in special ed costs over the past few years. We believe that is somewhat related to the pandemic. And I'll explain later and how that impacted our budget in a positive way. Uh, we also have special ed grants that are pretty much flat funded, even though our special ed population does continue to rise. Those grants are pretty flat funded, um, which is something I'm advocating for with my groups to get better funding at the federal level, because those grants that are in there are considered um, federal grants. Our EL program costs continue to go up. You, you see the percentages, you see the numbers. It's a very a significant impact on our district. Uh, our magnet school tuition hovers around $400,000. We actually, though our student headcount is right around 4,000, when in some of the ways they calculate our per pupil cost, we actually have about 4,200 kids who we're financially responsible for. That includes kids who are in magnet schools, 
or who have to be outplaced due to their special education needs. So those students all carry a cost with them wherever they go. And that is something that the board has to pay for. Our, our homeless costs have been stable for the past few years or a little bit down this year. Again, I do believe some of that has to do with the pandemic. We don't know yet where ECS money is going to be. So I just put a placeholder in it th the same as last year. I was told today by a state representative that we should be able to expect about the same amount that we had this year. Again, the ECS money goes straight to the town, but it does give them information about what they can expect uh, for their offsets. They did get a pretty good increase last year. It was about 300,000 or thereabouts. The budget that has been put together is designed to be very transparent. I definitely want our public to be familiar with it so they know all the parameters of it and what the thinking is behind this. And obviously I believe that the board and myself and my team need to be accountable to why are we putting certain things in the budget and how we made those decisions. So we're fully ready to answer those questions when the time comes. So it's interesting. Um, budgeting is a very complex situation. What we see today, what is planned for today doesn't mean it's going to be in place for next year. Think about two years ago. I was probably sitting before the board right around this time two years ago and the pandemic was looming. When I put forth that budget, I did not know of the tremendous changes that were going to happen with the pandemic a mere two months or even a month and a half after a night like tonight. So what you plan for right now may look very different when the school, the school year starts in the fall of 2022. Case in point is our budgets over the last two years. Um, you know, some we have had budgets that were not super big increases, but what we noticed when we did some analysis is we had expenses that were lower these last two years. Um, why is that? We believe a lot of it does have to do with two reasons. One is the pandemic. Uh, certainly during this school year, we were not really fully operational the last three months of the school year. And as, as the board, at least some of the board members who were on the board at that time, we had much lower transportation costs, facilities costs, um, personnel costs, uh, substitute costs. And that really resulted in a budget of realized savings at the end of the year, about $2.4 million. And it's important for the, the board to know that we did very, very cautiously and transparently do some, I think, pretty responsible things with the budget. We put the money into non-lapsing. We have an agreement with the town that we can put a 1%, one percentage point of any realized savings in our budget back into the non-lapsing fund. And I, I do believe that was a very prudent thing for us to do. We also had a surplus in excess cost. Now, what does that mean? We project our excess costs to the state and it's, it's based on what we know at a certain point in the school year, whether it, an excess cost is money that the state reimburses us for, for very high cost special education students. It's a, it's a complex concept, but essentially if a child exceeds a certain threshold, the state is supposed to pay us for that amount. Now, typically that is an offset in the operating budget, but lap, two years ago, that excess amount was not used or not all of it was used. So that money was sent directly back to the town. It has to, under state statute, it's required. And then the surplus declaration at the end of the year is this amount of money, 1.5 million also went back to the town. So if, for example, we make a, our best guess tonight and in the subsequent couple of days during budget deliberations, but if for some reason there is a surplus at the end of the year, we have been very transparent about sending some of that money back to the town. Um, and similarly, last year, we also had uh, money left at the end of the year, and we also did the same thing with the non-lapsing. Again, that, that type of planning has helped us in a lean year like this year. Similarly, the excess cost was also in it, um, higher than we, we got more back than we could spend. So that went right back to the town. It was almost a million dollars 
And then we declared a surplus of $500,000. So these bottom two numbers went back to the town and the top number, the non-lapsing, went into a non-lapsing fund, which is actually overseen by the town. So when we started the budget process months and months ago, and our administrators, many of them whom are on the call, had worked with their building teams to come forward with recommendations or requests. So out of the gate, if every request were honored, we had about an 8% increase. But obviously we knew we had to get our, sharpen our pencils, get ready to cut things to get it to a more reasonable number. First and foremost, we, we, our technology needs are very high and we cannot really, if we keep them in the, in the um, board's budget, we would have these huge increases every year. Keeping our one-to-one -one, uh, program rolling is something that's very important to us and especially now in this environment, but it is even without the pandemic. We are very much a technology integrated uh, district. So we have looked at the rule sets around technology and the board CIP and moved that request over there and the board of ed approved that uh, a few weeks back. So we re removed all of those equipment items into the uh, tech, the board CIP, which reduced us down to 6.91%. Similarly, we initially had the buses in the operating budget. We have not gotten a lot of bus money um, in quite some time, but I, we are hoping that the, the town does fund that. We did take it out of operating and put it toward the town CIP uh, budget because of this buses are, uh, more in line with the rule set of the town CIP. So that reduced our budget by 431,180 or six down to 6.35. We believe um, based on our increased open choice participation, we are comfortable saying that we will have another $250,000 this year in open choice revenue, which we felt comfortable reduced our budget by 6.02%, down to 6.02%. We got some good news very recently that our Anthem costs are looking like they're gonna go down a little bit. That's not true for a lot of our neighbors. I have a colleague right next door who has a significant insurance bur burden um, within the, um, with their budget and that's gonna jack up their budget costs. But we are fortunate with our current agreement that it does keep our, I've been very impressed with it because in, I had quite a bit of volatility in my insurance rates uh, in, in Plainville. So the fact that we're able to do these offsets, we're down to 5.24%. And then we have done some buy aheads this year to bring us further down to 4.85%. And then lastly, on this second page, we've moved uh, some of our security projects to the CIP, namely some of our, um, we call them man traps and other uh, related security investments. Those have been moved to CIP. That brought us down to 474 and um, let's see, then we also found when you go through the budget and you look at all the tables and what have you, there are sometimes duplications. That was another decrease by 80,000 to 4.58. And then lastly, as again, when you go through the budget right before you print the budget books, you find that there are other you know, inconsistencies or errors. So we were able to shave off another $33,000 or 4.54%. So that is where we sit right now. I do believe um, we may be able to reduce this over the coming days um, or weeks for a variety of reasons. Um, as of yesterday, or I guess actually officially today is when I signed it, our early retirement incentive plan, and I would like to thank Steve Farisi and um, Lou Giacomowitz who did a lot of legwork on this. It has been signed off by the union. So now we will roll it out. Um, we want to share the details of that with the board next week in executive session so that we'll, once that the board has seen it um, that we can move it forward and offer it to uh, our teachers to see if anyone is interested in taking that incentive and as the board knows if people do take the incentive there's a good chance that well first of all anyone that leaves we'd analyze do we need their position and secondly if we do there's a high probability that the position will be cheaper because it wouldn't be someone at the top step anymore. I have instituted a budget freeze and um, the budget freeze 
is meant to really not, we aren't able to fill any positions right now unless they're absolutely essential. And we will also continue to analyze the budget so that perhaps with this freeze, we won't have to use as much of the non-lapsing fund as we had initially planned for, which is $2 million. We have had to be realistic that utilities and other uh, supplies have gone up due to inflation, um, but we may be wrong. Maybe we estimated too high. So the longer we get closer to, um, you know, when the budget needs to be finalized, maybe we'll get some um, estimates that will come in lower, which would be uh, ideal. We, in addition to my previous uh, slide where we indicated that the open choice revenues have increased because of our numbers increasing, there is some legislation pending that may actually increase the reimbursement by student. So if that does go through, we maybe have an additional offset in the open choice area. And then we are, as always, if anyone leaves or if anyone retires, as I mentioned in the earlier uh, bullet point, then we are going to, first of all, analyze, do they need to be replaced? And if they do, can we do so at a lower pay rate? So here's just kind of a summary of the budget drivers. The big driver here is, is if we do in fact have to use the full $2 million of non-lapsing money, that more or less puts us in the hole. The, the reality is our budget last year was 2.61% increase. And again, last year that was strictly a maintenance budget as well. Um, we did not add new staff. Any of the new staff that were added last year or this year were all tied to the ESSER monies. We have contractual obligations. Every uh, bargained contract has salary increases, and those result in about a 1.5 million increase. Employee benefits, it ranges anywhere from obviously health insurance, but also any other uh, life insurance obligations or uh, retirement funds have to be paid for. And then all other includes the supplies, materials, utilities, and special education. We do believe, and this is an estimate, because you know this budget is an evolution. Uh, we think we will still have about 1.1 million dollars in non-lapsing fund monies to use at the end at the end of this year that we can apply to next year's budget. So that would leave us with a total of 3.4 million on this line. <clears throat> Excuse me. Salaries. Um, so if we look at it through a different lens, salaries have our budget go up by 2.06%, 2.06%. If we look at the employee benefits, that's a 0.76 fraction of the budget. If we look for other supplies, utilities, that's 0.58. So our actual budget increase this year, if we didn't have to make up for the $2 million in non-lapsing money, this is, would have been our increase this year. But because of that utilization of non-lapsing, we have to backfill that because that that chunk of the budget still needs to be uh, fulfilled. Um, so another kind of look see at how this all comes together. Again, the non-lapsing resources accounts for 2.61 percent. The salaries, benefits, all other. If we are able to use, um, we estimate that the non-lapsing fund monies that will be remaining at the end of this year could shave off about 1.47%. And that brings us to 4.54%. And again, this is just another way of summarizing it with a little more detail, but this really shows you the impact on all of our lines and what that, how that contributes to the bottom line of 4.54%. Just kind of going through this, I think we've covered the top three already. Um, this sort of illustrates the impact of the non-lapsing fund. So this year it creates an additional 2.61%, but we believe this amount will offset next year by 1.47%. Um, we have a significant amount of ESSER grant money that we are able to apply to the um, budget as an offset. So that amount of money is not part of our ask. And we are obviously aware that this money isn't gonna be around forever. So we are in the planning stages of how to um, work with those positions so that they do not impact the budget long-term. And there, we've got some ideas on how to do that. 
And then um, supplies we've already talked about. And again, so the increase we're asking for is 3.482, 843, or 4.54%. Um, here's just another summary. Last, last year's budget and the year before were both 76,768,011. This year I'm requesting 80,250,854. There's the increase of 3.4 million or 4.54%. What could happen? To any further reductions? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we hope that there will be some other reductions that will come forward in the next couple of weeks, such as the impact of ARIP, such as the impact of our budget freeze, such as the hopeful good news about more open choice reimbursements. All of those could take the 4.54 and bring it down to size without impacting any existing programs. But eventually, I, I can't tell you an exact percentage but it, it very, very close to where we're at right now, we would have to start looking at um, reduction in force. Obviously, we'd always go through attrition. We'd always go through all the right ways to do it. But at some point, you uh, really run the risk of impacting your programs. And what does that look like? You start cutting positions. And it, it, there are, you don't typically cut classroom teachers because those children need somewhere to go but you may cut some support staff that would lead to higher class sizes if we were to combine some classes uh, our students mental health is just through the roof and the thought of having to reduce our mental health staff right now would be i will tell you very upsetting if not traumatic to our teachers um, if we were to tinker with our special ed services that could put us in some legal peril we want to we're already trying to come back from the pandemic. If we lose any staff, our efforts to get children back on track would be impeded. Um, and obviously that's both learning, recovery and achievement. Our school climate, cultural and morale impact, I, that worries me almost as much as all these other ones that our teachers are already feeling extraordinarily overworked and stressed and spread thin. If we were to cut staff, I can only imagine how that would um, further impact their levels of stress. You know, again, um, though it may, one strategy that may be employed is, you know, if you have a lower ask, then the taxpayers are less impacted. But one of the things we may have to consider is, you know, increasing our Chromebook fees, our sports fees, or our building usage fees, if the budget is cut significantly to offset some of those cuts. So you're sort of, maybe the parents have a slightly less tax increase, but they're gonna have to pay for fees. Um, you know, it, it, it's really important for me to show the board that the years highlighted in green are the two years that I've been, um, superintendent where I actually created the budget this year, 2019, 20, I inherited this budget, but my two years in the district, first year, I got a 2.67 increase, second year zero. Um, so the two year increase of budgets that I have overseen is about 1.04%. Looking at the uh, history over the last five or six years, the board has only had an average of a 1.6% increase. That's quite reasonable given that there is inflation every year and given that from year to year, the contracts do provide for increases for staff for their, for their salaries. Um, the town CIP, which uh, provides for capital expenses uh, in excess of, I believe, $25,000, over the past um, same period of time, our average per year is about 451.099. And this is really where we get funding for buses, uh, previously technology, not anymore. Some of our capital improvements and security and other types of uh, large ticket items come out of this pot, but it really hasn't had a lot of significant money in it over the last six years. For sake of comparison, this is where the town fares um, a little bit higher at 2.03 over the last six years. Um, but the CIP that the town has had has a significantly higher than the board CIP. Now, in, in full disclosure, we also have a board CIP that is not on this chart. And that does hover at, well, it is capped at 1.1 million. And it is funded by some of the receipts that we get from a variety of sources. Plus, I believe the town contributes 125000 to it every year. 
Um, right now, this is what's coming in from um, districts in our area um, that are of similar composition. We, um, not everyone has their budget at the same time as us. So there's question marks where we don't have that information. I can tell you that um, both our two, some of our closest neighbors are right in line with our increase, Berlin, Rocky Hill, Weathersfields, uh, we were, we did get some information about that today, but it's not being released to the public um, until Saturday, but I will tell you it is higher than ours. And the rest of these districts are, you know, slightly lower. Um, I did look at the districts around, you know, trying to get information about increases from last year. And I could not find any districts on this chart that had a 0% last year. So what are the next steps? Um, obviously, uh, we are discussing our board goals and review tonight. And then uh, I am on what I call my road show for the next few weeks. I'll be going to probably mostly virtual PTO meetings, um, faculty meetings. Um, I may host a parent forum, um, uh, you know, online. The board is aware that we have budget workshops coming up on the 8th and the 9th. And on the 16th, we do have a regular board meeting. On the 23rd, we the board would need to come to some final uh, decisions about the budget because it has to be transmitted to the town. Uh, so the board would approve some sort of bu budget on February 23rd, and then that gets transmitted to the town. And on March 8th, Dr. Fletcher and I present the budget as it currently sits at that time to the town council. So without, with that, I'll come out of my screen here and see if there are any questions. Okay, right now we're gonna keep the questions to board members. And once we're done with board members, then we'll move on to public participation. <clears throat> okay, uh, Danielle Drozd. Mute, I'm on mute already. Okay. All right, sorry. Um, my my face is still numb, so I've been hiding my face. Um, so I have two questions, Dr. Fletcher. I don't know if one is um, if this is an appropriate time to ask it. So if it's not, we can we can certainly table it. But my first one is who negotiated the union contract for retirement? Like, is I I thought my understanding was that. That would be a negotiations and i just want to make sure that it's not going to come back and be like we couldn't do it that way so i know we're trying to save money with that but i want to make sure that we're above board on that that's my first question and my second one is um, um you're referring to the open choice and i know the legislation you're referring to um it was the big chef versus the nail it was all over the news it was awesome but i thought our open choice money went back into our school wide CIP funds so that wouldn't help offset our operating budget. So those are my two questions. Okay. So as far as the uh, union negotiation, I, I think Mr. Farisi would be the one to give an answer to that. So if you wouldn't mind, Mr. Farisi. Not at all. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fletcher. Um, so we have worked with the union in the past um, to wow. discuss the parameters around that uh, between the union, Dr. Brummett, Lou Jack Moe, and myself. Um, we discussed opportunities for an early retirement incentive uh, package, uh, which then we have an opportunity to share with the board. So I do know that that is upcoming. Um, I think Dr. Brummett just scheduled a meeting uh, this evening uh, for the board uh, on that topic. Um, but we, we did do that in collaboration with the Teachers Association. Yeah. And so that uh, executive meeting is going to be Tuesday at 545. So we did, as the board will be able to see that. I did see that. I just, my only question is, is I just want to make sure that we're above board with the, I thought the negotiations had to have like a board piece of it. And I, I don't know, I'm new. So I just want to. Yeah, this is a sure little bit different. It, it's not a negotiation for salaries. It's just us as a board of education offering an incentive package for people for early retirement. And the motive behind it is to reduce our budget as much as possible. And it actually is a memorandum of understanding, much like we had to do for 
some of the agreements we reached during COVID. So that is something that is typically done uh, with central office leadership. But the board will have full uh, understanding of what it is. They'll have a full understanding of how we would propose to pay for any folks that are potentially going to take advantage of it. But it is not a negotiations. It is a memorandum of understanding um, <coughs> that, you know, is something that is in the purview of central office to work on with staff. Um, and we had a second question from Ms. Droz. Uh, is that something we can wait until next week to discuss? Well, I guess it's not, we can, I can, we can certainly talk about the, or we can talk about the MOU and, and what that looks like in um, next week. But the other question I had was if the open choice, if our funds from the open choice are going to our school wide, our school, our P CIP, is that actually going to offset our budget if legislation actually goes through with it? Uh, that's an excellent question. I don't mind fielding it right now. The the way it works in Newington is the um, to the tuition or the reimbursement that we get from um, Open Choice for strictly the regular ed costs are allowed to be an offset in the board budget. It's been that way for years. Where we can't take the offset is the special ed costs that we get reimbursed from um, Hartford. That has to be treated. Um, differently. Now, I will tell you some districts allow both, or not some districts, some boards have the option to have both of those go to board budget, but in the way we have our charter here in Newington, that's how it's handled. Okay, does that answer your questions? Okay, very good. Do we have any other board members with questions? Anastasia Yop. Hello, I just have a couple questions. Um, my first question, um, Dr. Fletcher, be for Dr. Brummett. Um, why would the Chromebook free, uh, Chromebook fee increase? I, I heard you say something about the Chromebook fee increasing. Dr. Brummett. It was only in terms of if we needed to, um, grapple with a budget shortfall. In other words, if the budget is cut further than an, uh, some way to recoup that is to increase our Chromebook fees. Currently, there is not a plan to raise them. Um, and as the board knows, we're using some of those fees this year to offset um, technology costs. But that would be the only uh, circumstance that we would raise Chromebook insurance fees is if we needed another offset. Thank you. I have another question. Go ahead. Um, seeing that we had a surplus last year, why would, be, why, are we, why would we be in the hole if we have a surplus? We are, that's last year's budget. The, the, this year's budget, we had a 0% increase. So we had to look at how to fix that hole by using some of our non-lapsing money. You can't like, we're not allowed to use, when we close out the year on June 30th, any money that is not expended at that time has to be returned to the town. Um, it can't be carried forward. Um, that's just a state statute, actually. It's nothing to do necessarily with Newington. But when, <laughs> when our budget was approved last year at a 0% increase, um, we were faced with a tough choice. The board at the time was, do we cut staff to get down that $2 million shortfall? Or do we access our non-lapsing money, which we did make that decision to do so with the board's support? So that's, that's the difference. And my last question is, um, I keep hearing us say we're going to cut staff. Are we talking about the temporary staff that um, was paid for by the ESSER fund, or are you talking about permanent staff that was hired prior to that? If we um, have a very low or a zero budget increase, we will have to reduce our staffing. Um, how that is handled, we would have to decide at the time. The, the grant money that um, I, share, I shared it in more detail with the board the other night at my evaluation discussion, but those folks are all paid for out of grant money and it's for very specific goal areas. So if the time came to cut staff, we would have to look at how to do it in a way that didn't violate the grant restrictions and also was in keeping with contractual reduction in force um, guidelines. 
Thank you. Okay, and Ms. Hutt Wagner. Thank you. Um, I think many would agree with me when we say that um, it would be detrimental to cut staff for so many reasons. Um, being a teacher myself, this is a very, very difficult year. Um, however, I'm wondering if you can kind of give us some insight so that we're all um, best educated in our planning here. Is there like a magic number percentage wise that would that would kind of indicate, OK, at this percentage, we would have to start cutting staff just so that we can be mindful of that in, in our planning. And obviously, just disclaimer, I'm not saying that I want to do that, but um, just to be fiscally responsible in that in that realm. If, yeah, if the board would like Lou and I to work on that calculation um, in time for our meetings next week, we can take a stab at it. It would be an estimate, but we could probably take a stab at it. I don't have that number for you tonight. No problem. I just wanted to kind of put it out there, um, mm -hmm. like I said, in just in efforts to help us make educated decisions. Yep. We will, we will have a, a very good estimate for Tuesday evening. Sounds good. Any other board members with questions? Mr. Sharma? Okay, I got a, I got a quick question on, I was looking at the budget. Um, can you talk about like the, the homeless students? Are those students who live in town and we go pick them up or what is, what is that expense for? <clears throat> um, it's a, there's a law that we all have to adhere to um, in our state called McKinney-Vintnow. And what that does is if a student initially resides in Newington and for whatever reason their their residency um, is impacted and they lose their home whether they're evicted or the parents um, you know lose their home to, to to fall on the mortgage so then they're displaced and sometimes they're displaced uh, out of town you know we've had kids displaced as far as Meriden or you know Manchester or even farther Waterbury we are required by law to provide transportation to bring them back to Newington for schooling. The law basically was designed that kids are already under a tremendous strain and their families, if they're homeless, let's not uproot them from their educational surroundings. It's a very, very well-intentioned law, but it puts a burden on uh, taxpayers, the board, to uh, provide that, and each year we're averaging around seventy-five to eighty thousand dollars in um, transportation costs to make sure those homeless laws are adhered to. All right. Thanks. So I have a question related to that. I know that there are situations where children are taken into foster care, and Newington remains their nexus. Is the transportation cost to get them back here included in that, or is that a separate one? Uh, would you mind repeating that, Dr. Fletcher? <laughs> I'll try. So <laughs> okay. when there are children that are placed into foster care and Newington is their nexus, uh, if my understanding is, is that they have to be transported from wherever they are back here to their school. Is that included in the, in the cost of what we were just talking about, or is that a separate fund? Typically that is separate. It, although I've done battle with DCF about this, um, they're supposed to cover the cost of transporting a child. If they deem that uh, a child in foster care in Meriden should still come back to their home district in Newington, then they should bear the cost of the transportation. I will tell you that sometimes that does not happen. And we've had to, rather than let the child sit in their foster home uh, and not get to school, we've had to help those out. And we then we take take on DCF as we can to get the money back. Okay, thank you. Any other board members with questions? Okay. Seeing that we have no more board members with questions, I'm gonna to move to agenda item D and I'm gonna open it up for public participation. Uh, public participation is limited to three minutes. And we ask that you state your name and just the street address. You do not need to give your street number for your, for your own privacy and your own safety. So at this time, uh, let me get my stopwatch ready here. And Ms. Havens, please go ahead. Hi, Dana Havens, Stoddard Avenue. 
Um, my ears perked up when you said early retirement. And that's because I'm a state employee and I would love to take early retirement, but the state refuses to offer that anymore because they've realized early retirement packages actually ended up costing the state way too much money further down the road. Because when you retire early, you tend to live longer and then there's all the health problems, yada, yada. So I'm concerned that if we start offering it here, that we're gonna run into those same problems a few years down the road and um, if you found a workaround about that, could you please let Governor Lamont know so I could retire early? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, just to explain, we do withhold our comments or answers. We will get back to you with answers to the questions that you, that you give us. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to uh, speak now? Mr. Helvey. Sorry, I got my mask on. I'm in one of the schools, so I, uh, I can't take my mask off. <laughs> um, actually, on a similar topic uh, related to early retirement, one of my concerns in state higher education, we're looking at about a 20% attrition rate and then all of the hidden costs that are going to be involved with losing so many people, you know, our faculty, staff. My concern is, have we looked at the hidden costs of what we're facing right now in K-12 in terms of people who are just leaving the profession altogether, which is, as you know, happening at high, high rates, higher than many of us have seen before. Uh, and then obviously, if there's an opportunity for an early retirement, I think we're going to find a lot of you know, our staff jump on top of that opportunity. So my concern is, you know, those hidden costs, when you hire in new people who may not have the same experience and background, and how are they going to serve the students in the same way that some of our veteran staff do? So I think that, to me, is another concern that I would have about um, the attrition and the cost that that's involved, and how that might you know that might further impact us down the long run. Short term, maybe that's great. Get a couple newer teachers in; doesn't cost as much as that veteran teacher. But then, when you think about all the training that you have to pay to get that newer teacher up to speed, so that they can try and keep up with those veteran teachers you end up paying a lot more down the long road. So I think that's one of the concerns I have is how are we looking at staff attrition, which is a very real immediate concern as a financial threat that we are going to have to deal with in the year ahead. Um, and how does the budget maybe account for that sort of challenge that we're going to face? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helvey. And Forrest, if you don't mind taking your hand down, I'd appreciate that. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to participate right now? All right. Seeing that there is no more public participation, I'm going to move on to agenda item E, which are remarks by board members. So if any of the board members wish to share anything more or have any more questions, uh, this is your opportunity to do that. <clears throat> Ms. Weaver. Yeah, I just want to um, thank Dr. Berman and her team for putting the, the starting wheels on this. I think um, sometimes when we see the first initial presentation, um, it's kind of like, what? What's going on? Um, so I look forward to the intense budget book we are promised tomorrow um, that will get into the weeds and really get into the work. I think this is really, you know, a starting point and definitely not going to be the finishing point, but um, just appreciate all the work I know that's going into this round the clock because budgeting is uh, art and a science that is just so much fun and why we're all here. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it's gonna be uh, a good process for us to go through this budget page by page. And I know I'm, I'm very confident it will be even thicker than last year uh, in terms of what we're looking at. So I'm um, just looking forward to working with everyone in the next couple of weeks to make this budget the best it can be. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weaver. And Mr. LeVarriere. Yes, uh, I just want to say pro, um, as a preliminary matter, I do think that more than the four, uh, greater than 4% increase, um, it's it's quite a big, uh, big number to me. Um, you know, I'm curious to, to see how we could maybe work together to maybe get that, uh, get that number down because uh, although we don't want, we want to make sure that the students uh, have everything that they need, of course, 
uh, and support the teachers and support the, the schools. But um, that's a, that's a big ask for the uh, for the taxpayers. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Any more board members wish to participate? All right, uh, Ms. Droz. Um, Rick, very quickly, I do want to agree and reiterate what um, Mr. Laverriere said. So I agree completely with what he said. Okay, thank you. Ms. Yop? Um, I was going to say I agree as well. Um, I am for, you know, helping the students, the teachers, the staff. I understand the COVID, you know, the corona, I'm sorry, has put, you know, teachers and administration and, you know, um, tough times, but I do also want to ensure the taxpayers aren't going to, you know, take on, you know, all of this. I mean, it, it is a lot, um, but I am looking forward to working with, you know, everyone and seeing what we can do, but I do have to agree with Richard on this one. All right, thank you. Any other board members? Okay. So this will probably be one of the shortest meetings that we experience over the next few weeks. Uh, and with that said, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Motions made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. You all have a good night. We will see you back here Tuesday. Thank you. Bye.